Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. How are you this morning? I'm doing fine, doing good. fine and dandy. And uh, this is a, it's a go after the problems. And uh, we always seem to have a problem we can talk about, but we always have an answer, okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I, and I think that is important to know what the problem is. But uh, people who finally discover it and they play on it, and all they want to do is vary the problem. Oh, I'm a better manager. Yeah. You know, they don't say get rid of the Fed. They say, we know somebody else who can run the money system better. So they always have an alternative to intervention. Our approach is a little bit different. If our foreign policy is failing overseas, it's not to send them more money and more troops and go bankrupt over it. It's to change the policy. And, of course, uh, we take a guide from uh, the tradition of the Constitution, recognizing it's shortcoming, but we certainly recognize where the Constitution is now, certainly the changes made in the last hundred years. You know, yeah. it's been greatly diminished as an important instrument. But there was an election, not in the U.S., uh, this weekend, I guess, in Italy. Yeah. And the elections uh, turned out not too badly. They said, we're getting sick and tired of these guys. Yeah. We're, we're, the status quo is not what we want. And uh, somebody not too long ago wasn't uh, well known. And all of a sudden, you know, it's moving in that direction. But it's a message sent that the status quo actually is not satisfactory you can't uh go i guess it was reagan that made that big point you know are you better off yeah. well he did that against uh, uh carter but uh a lot of people would uh, you know if they've had a good four years they'll say look at what we did look at what we did this isn't the case this and, it, and this is the case and maybe that's true in this country too even though if you listen to the ads already uh, they're not saying uh, well we came up short what we need to do is we overspend. To telling the truth uh, is an absolute negative uh, under today's conditions. And uh, even those who have the alternatives, sometimes they're fudging the figures too because it's pie in the sky stuff. You know, oh yeah, I know what to do. It, the whole problem was in this country is uh, that that uh, Biden said it, the inflation is transitory. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> this country is transitory yeah, is our no problem. Country. And that's why we like to get to the bottom of it. But there was this, was this election, I would say that uh, there's a little bit of good news there. It's a big deal. I mean, this is a political earthquake. And as we'll, as we'll discuss later on in the show, this is not something that's a 100% victory for those of us against the bad guys. But it is a big deal. Italy is a big deal. It's the second largest economy in Europe. And it's easy to forget that. But it's a big powerhouse country. And they did a radical shift. They, they elected a center-right, right-wing supermajority, it looks like, or close to it, over the weekend. And let's put on that first clip because it's headed by the, the future prime minister is a Georgia Maloney, who is a great speaker, uh, a great presence, the first woman prime minister in Italy's history, the first female prime minister. Her party is the Brothers of Italy party. And I've highlighted the part that's fascinating, I think, and explains some of her success. Uh, Maloney's Brothers of Italy party, which won just 4% of the vote during the last national election in 2018, won the biggest share of the vote on Saturday's part on Sunday's parliamentary elections, 22.5 to 20. 6.5 percent so from four percent in 2018 to 25 or so percent now just four years later that is a remarkable remarkable shift and you would ask well what happened I mean, wh how can you justify such a huge shift uh in 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 italian politics well i think this next clip this is from a reuters article i think this might explain some of it dr paul whereas her allies matteo salvini and Sir silvio berlusconi joined forces with the center-left last year to form a unity government under Mario Draghi, Meloni refused, saying appointing an unelected former central banker was undemocratic. Now, here's the part that I think is interesting. That decision left the Brothers of Italy as the sole major party in opposition, giving it a pass on having to defend unpopular decisions taken during the COVID emergency. So staying out of that alliance with Draghi and his Goldman Sachs buddies, gave them clean hands to say, we didn't support the COVID restriction. And in Italy, as we've discussed, Dr. Paul, these restrictions, these lockdowns were horrific, among the worst in the world. So she had clean hands. And I just can't help but thinking 
that that has some effect on the Italian voter. You know, there's a famous quote, and I've used it, you know, an idea whose time has come can't be stopped by armies, and that's been around, and, and what I'm going to say is an, a, a variation of that, because it's not so much uh, ideological, and yet it really is, it's the rejection of the policies that they've had. They were talking about policies, and uh, it looks like the, her popularity, that surge on this, I would say, you know, uh, somebody's time has come, and maybe it's the time that people wake up, time they're sick and tired of it, and time that the real enemy is being recognized, and uh, it, it wasn't stopped by the establishment. <clears throat> That's why when we have a victory here over the uh, Main Street media, and all the propaganda, and the FBI, I and everybody else, <clears throat> you know, it, it's really in, encouraging that ideas are powerful, even though there are times where I know and understand why people would be very frustrated. If that's the case, how do the really bad guys get so much power? And uh, yet most of them don't live long lives either when they're really, really bad people. And uh, so I, I see this as uh, as not just a fly in the sky some guy gets up and says you know i'm going to be i'm going to be a better dictator than the other guys and all we need is to throw this party out and put this party in these these people that voted this way knew exactly what what was going on and they were sick and tired of it and that has already happened and we've mentioned it many times on this program that people people finally got sick and tired of uh, uh of the lockdowns and uh and, and it's just to totally ignore I like Biden says it's all over there's no pandemic anymore look yeah. no mask out there yeah. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's all a, a con game but this is good I'm uh, delighted to hear this and I hope uh, uh, that it's followed through and I have no idea because I don't know the politics of, of Italy yeah and there has to be a few uh, free market people there yeah and you know the interesting thing and you wrote about this this week too Ironically, the right wing in Italy owes a great debt of gratitude to their arch enemy, which is the European commissioner. And the interesting part is, and you, you, you point this out, she herself is unelected. I'm talking about Ursula von der Leyen. She is unelected, yet she threatened a couple of days before she, the election, she threatened the Italians, if you vote the wrong way, there's going to be consequences. And we actually have a, cl a clip of her saying this if we can play that first audio clip, and I think we play the whole thing through, it's about 20 seconds of good old Ursula. If you can find that, put that up here, I think we're, here we go, here's Ursula. We can play the whole clip. got some audio problems. It's, it's low audio. It doesn't matter. That's her. We don't have to put it back up. She says, we'll see. If things go in a difficult direction, and I've spoken about Hungary and Poland, we have the tools. We have the tools. So she's saying, because you know, Hungary has bucked the uh, European Union a couple of times. They're not super keen on these sanctions. Poland has done the same thing. So she's basically saying, we have been able to smack down Hungary and Poland and Italy if you misbehave and if you vote for the wrong people, the people that we won't allow you to vote for, we have tools. We have ways of making you talk. And I really do think, and you saw after this happened, there were huge rallies in Italy. We don't care what von der Leyen says. We don't care what she says. I think it gave them a boost in the end. I think she gave them, <laughs> they owe her a debt of gratitude. Well, w w when a nation gets into trouble and it's being run by thugs and authoritarians, <coughs> they they can't say that they have a wonderful philosophy and we just need uh, a couple more bucks. That works for a while, but then it finally ends. Then it has to become more violent. It becomes uh, violent with, with threat. And uh, then there are acts of violence. And I was thinking of the tragic picture uh, this weekend uh, that uh, the FBI is on a defensive and they need to be put on a lot more defensive. But the, the family, the Catholic family, oh, yeah. there was a, showing how they went in there 
because because they disagreed with her, you know, and that means they're they are desperate because it doesn't even make good political sense. It's really you, you wonder what's going on because they're either really really stupid or they're uh, conniving for something else. But that it is so tragic how how they're getting worse, and that's going to happen more so. The FBI gets more uh, authoritarian, but uh, governments do, and that's what uh, they were. Rep- she was representing in, in Italy. Yeah. If, if, if you, but if you vote in a way I do not approve, you will be punished. Yeah. <laughs> People are getting punished in this country all the time. Yeah. You know, it threatened. There's yeah. a, so much. You know, the whole way they kept COVID uh, re- uh, restrictions on was intimidation. You know, people, there was still a powerful instinct for Americans, which uh, it, in many ways is a positive thing. They, they want law and order and they want to obey law, but, but then there's a, there's a limit. And how do you reach that limit and what do you do about it? You know, uh, Martin Luther King had a, a good answer for this. You have peaceful disobedience yeah. is when it gets to a certain point. And uh, that we uh, so far i think that uh right right now it's getting more violent people when they're losing power power to them eventually is more important to them than money because most of the time they have uh you know the insiders have a lot of money so i don't think they oh if we get another billion dollars we're going to be happy people but boy they do they love power and molding what the world is like what the population should be obedience is the most important thing that they do and that was that was a, a test run with the lockdown and it was worldwide yeah. they they uh, they showed uh, how powerful they are i was uh, really impressed on how global that effort was because they never had proof of anything science were they on the side of science they said they were but i think the people are waking up and finding out uh, you know you you have to be careful now if you're a well-known politician in washington if you overstep your bounds you might get booed yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we heard about that <laughs> i think it's great that you make that uh, connection between someone like von der Leyen, who is an authoritarian and our authoritarians here at home because just like von der Leyen is not elected the deep state here the fbi and all the creeps that raid houses of people they don't like they're also not elected so there's a good connection but the thing is i don't want to get too i don't think we should A, it's really not our business what's happening in Italy, although we like the idea of throwing the bums out. But I don't think we should get too optimistic because the the policies of of, uh, the Brothers of Italy party, Maloney herself, are not as radical as you might think. And here's from that same Reuters article. And so just put this up here as a cautionary tale, if we can put that next clip up. She has reassured Italy's establishment, touting a strong pro-West message, vowing to boost defense spending and undertaking to stand up to Russia and China. It will not be the usual spaghetti and mandolin in Italy that fails to show up when history beckons. So for all of that, and still we're happy that the status quo was voted out of office, but she's in favor of sending weapons to Ukraine. Uh, She's in favor of the sanctions, uh, which have hurt Italy's economy very seriously. So there's gonna have to be a reckoning. Maybe that was her campaign ploy, but I mean, it's, it's too early to get super excited beyond the fact that the bums were thrown out and it may have some implications for our own elections here. No, your, your point is very important because uh, it's easy to attack and it's good to attack. It's good to get rid of it. But where the failure comes is they're usually going to replace it with just a modification and a pretense that it's something new and different. But you have to be prepared for the replacement. And I contend, uh, I, I, you know, I deal with this all the time when people ask me, yeah, would you close down the Fed? Well, it needs closed down, but you have to recognize some of the problems. But you have to know, what are you going to do when you don't have a Federal Reserve? I said, well, it's, it's not that difficult. Why don't you look at, at the country, the first 150 years, <laughs> we, we didn't have a no Federal kidding. Reserve. So it's the replacement. You know, how are the, how, how are the sick going to be taken care of? How are they going to be fed? All this stuff, if you want to reduce the government because they're always on a noble crusade yeah. you know and uh, i imagine 90 percent of the people who went along in the early years on uh, lockdown they it was a holy crusade and uh they they were doing this for humanity's sake bill gates said that he's a yeah. humanitarian yeah. that's his whole life it, isn't that amazing how he developed that reputation and when we look at what he really dies and <laughs> believes exactly 
Well, we're going to just briefly touch on the next one, and that's what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I think we're three days into referendums being held in four provinces in eastern Ukraine with regard to joining Russia. Now, the U.S. and its NATO allies have said we will not recognize these are sham votes uh, to leave Ukraine and join Russia, although they, had, they sang a different tune when it was Kosovo because they approved of that breakup. But nevertheless, what, what the implications of this are, are pretty serious, I think, because these four breakaway republics, and they're by and large Russian-speaking, 90% Russians, um, if they do vote to join Russia, that will mean that the borders, at least in terms of how Russia views things, uh, have moved that much further in, and they have made it pretty clear. Medvedev, who the former president, who's now the deputy security council head, said that we will consider this part of our border and they will get all the constitutional protections, including our strategic nuclear uh, deterrence. Uh, so it is kind of an escalation for sure to take these over and make it. So the question is, what does the U.S. do? What does NATO do? Do we keep pumping in weapons? Are we going to attack this new area, which Russia at least views as Russia? That would mean a direct attack on Russian territory, at least according to how Russians view it, by NATO, by NATO forces, by NATO tanks. The, the danger here, I think, cannot be understated. Yeah, it's a mess now, and it's hard to extricate ourselves from this because we're involved, we've been involved for a long time, and we were part of the coup, and we had talked enough about, you know, the coup of 2014 and how uh, it, history's going to show that maybe we started this mess, <laughs> and, and, you know, and this is a consequence. But I've argued from the very beginning, and it sounded that I was am being ambivalent on all this, but... Uh, I just didn't have a good feeling on what Russia was doing because there's another rule that you're supposed to consider and that's a proportional response yeah. to when you're attacked. And right now it's getting out of proportion. And uh, now it's become personal, who's losing, who's winning. And, and, uh, it's, uh, and, and when, when, you, when you were, they were talking about Crimea, the case was a little clearer, but now it's getting, getting messy. And uh, it's, a, it's a, something that I think is gonna be a, very difficult to change, but we have to know what caused it in order to prevent it. And that was, I found out in a campaign that they don't want to hear the cause. Oh, no. It's, what do you do if you're in politics <laughs> and we're part of the problem? You know, that's, 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 that leads to problems, you know, uh, that uh, you, you can't deal with because it becomes very political and they play on it. But I always thought that if you tell the truth each time, eventually you might win some here and there, but uh, the, the battle is for purveying and pursuing truth rather than saying, am I going to be the king and dictator and have the most money? And yeah. that's what it morphs into now. And then the American people, who, who's, who's getting stuck with the bills? It's our American taxpayers. And uh, I don't think they, they're, I have to say there's a little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, wisdom coming there. The American people, you know, on occasion you hear the politicians saying, why are we sending the money to Ukraine when we still have so many problems here? Yeah, you know? no and, and that's a sort of a, 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 you know, a utilitarian argument, but it's a real one too, because every time you spend more money over there and print money and somebody's gonna suffer, and that's that's why I think it's important to be, be reminded if they're unhappy with the cost of living increases, they better study a little bit more about economics. And a little bit of history, too. You know, it's interesting how we don't know history. But, of course, people that live in these areas, they know their history very well. You know, in that part of Ukraine, Novorossiya, that was part of Russia until 1922 when Lenin, of all people, <laughs> said, OK, we're going to make it part of Ukraine now. And that was Soviet policy. They always wanted to mix nationalities up because it made the state stronger. Because if you keep people bickering on a local level, then the, the central government is the, you know, is the uh, referee. And so it's only since 1922, and it was done by Lenin himself, of putting those together. And of course, Crimea was in the 50s uh, with Khrushchev. And, and they all had that same, same sort of policy. So what we're really seeing are the, the implications uh, of the end of the Cold War even now and the breakup of the Soviet Union even that much later. Well, let's move on. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, a couple of clips that I have, because, Dr. Paul, I've got sad news. Someone has got COVID. Let's put up that Thomas Massey tweet, if we can. I'm going to skip ahead a couple. Um, so I think, yeah, here we go. So here's Albert Borla, Dr. Paul. You know who he is. He's the CEO of Pfizer. 
he made an announcement on the 24th of September. I have tested positive for COVID. I'm feeling well and symptom free. I've not had the new bivalent booster yet as I was following CDC guidelines to wait three months since my previous COVID case. So basically what's happened, the CEO of Pfizer fully vaxxed, fully boosted, fully shot, shot to the hilt. He got COVID not once, but twice in 40 days, twice in 40 days. That is not a great sales pitch yeah, for his serum. Yeah, but Daniel, I got to caution you. You're not telling the whole story uh -oh. because they have another sentence that they say, yes, but I, if I had not had those shots, I'd have gotten much sicker. Yeah. <laughs> and I would be, I would, uh, you know, but who knows who's going to be free from uh, myocarditis. Yeah. You know, that, that's the sad part about it. And there's a lot of young people that uh, have suffered. And, and you think of all these social batters, uh, uh, arguments have gone on, you know, with dealing with playing in sports and the few that have stood up against it, you know, like the tennis player. I mean, there were a few people that did on principle say, I don't, I'm not gonna take it. It's, it's just so, so divorced from the idea that people make their own decisions. And, uh, and this, this is, uh, you know, part of the strategy too, that you are owned by the government. And uh, you, you have your medical care by the doctor, you have your education by the doctors, you can depend on the food, uh, and all your, your income is determined by the government because they, they assume every cent you make is theirs, and you, they'll permit you to, uh, to uh, spend it on their terms. Yeah. So it's, it's not quite the free society that our founders envisioned. Well, let's skip ahead because we're gonna look at the next one. This is Borla himself. This probably pretty much tells you everything you need. And this is Dr. Eli David tweets about Borla. He says, four times vaxxed and double masked Pfizer CEO just tested positive for COVID <laughs> for the second time in under three months. Love the science will win slogan on his double mask. There you have it. And let's remind ourselves of Albert Borla, what he wrote back in April of 2021 <laughs> about his wonderful shots. Let's put that next one up. Excited to share that updated analysis from our phase three study with BioNTech also showed that our COVID-19 vaccine was 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 cases in South Africa. 100%. Fast forward to today, you get it twice, even though you've had four shots. That doesn't seem like a bargain. Dr. Paul, you mentioned myocarditis. We have a, a little clip from Tucker Carlson who talks about it. It's tragic. We don't really have time to, to deal with it in detail here, but let's listen to, I think, 37 seconds of what Tucker had to say in his monologue on this issue. So another topic that no one in the medical industry wants to talk about, and that's the COVID vaccine. And in some people who received it, there appears to be serious heart damage, far more than the experts thought would occur. The Lancet just surveyed young people ages 12 to 29 who suffered from myocarditis, heart damage, after taking the COVID shot. According to the Lancet, 90 days after myocarditis symptoms emerged, roughly 26% of young people who surveyed still needed daily medication because their hearts were so damaged. 20% said they had problems with their daily activities. 30% said they experienced pain. How will they be at age 60, you wonder? And of course, you know the answer. Hospitals were perfectly aware. Pretty scary stuff, Dr. Paul. Oh, it is. Pretty scary. And it's, the, the evidence is uh, not clear on what's going to happen in various other fields like infertility yeah. and the problems there. And uh, that's going to be around for, for a long time and they're going to be trying to, trying to sort it out. And they probably created a monster of a medical scientific problem ha having science sort out all the unscientific things they said and did uh, is a job and a half. But that, that is sad. It's just further proof that uh, you know, the authoritarian system where you lose the doctor patient relationship, where you lose uh, our ability to mind our own business in a personal way, in an economic way, or in an international way. And uh, I, I just say, we who believe this, and our numbers, I believe, are growing, we have to get really better at preventing, at presenting our viewpoints because they're so so well they're excellent you know they're superior at least to everything else uh because man is imperfect that's not going to work out exactly but uh we can, we can be pretty certain that the statistics shows that the people who desire power and will do anything to have it lie cheat and steal and you know they uh they have a greater motivation to have some position in government 
at all levels of government. And uh, even though George Soros has never been elected to anything, he has some clout that uh, has proven to be very powerful, especially <clears throat> the people who are influencing the rules uh, under COVID. Yeah. Well, I'm going to close out, Dr. Paul, and let's put up that last clip. New week, new reminder. Let's go to the next one, actually. We're going to skip that and move ahead to that final clip. Big conference, Lake Jackson, shut up, cancel culture and the war on speech. Dr. Paul will be speaking. Jeff Dice from the Mises Institute will be speaking. <coughs> Del Bigtree will be speaking. Himself canceled over his views on the same doctor-patient relationship that you mentioned. It's all about cancel culture. We've got other speakers we're going to announce. It's going to be a great, really fun conference down here in Lake Jackson. So get your tickets. Go to ronpaulinstitute.org and click on that picture. Or I will put a link also in the description. And we look forward to seeing you in just over a month's time. Very good. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today uh, to Liberty Report. And we're looking forward to our next conference. Uh, they give me a boost because I get to meet people who uh, are really in the trenches and trying to spread the word. But I think every one of us has a responsibility. And we don't even know exactly what that is. Just look for the opportunity. People will use you in certain ways to promote an idea, which is the most important thing. And that is the difference between, uh, you know, a free society and an authoritarian society. Authoritarianism, you know, cancels out the individual. And uh, that's exactly what we don't need. We we need a system of government that emphasizes, you know, the, the true diversity of individuals running their own lives. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.